Good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And uh, really excited to have our good friend, Thomas Perry, here with us, talking about the left-handed twin. Very welcome uh, uh, entry in the Jane Whitefield series. And Tom has graciously signed a bunch of them for us. And so I'll go ahead and put a link in the comments field, uh, should you like to purchase one. And also, if you have questions for Tom, please go ahead and put them in chat uh, on YouTube and comments on Facebook. I'll be happy to ask anything. So uh, Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to see Tom again. And I can remember all the way back to the first Jane Whitefield book when Tom came to see us at the Poison Pen as he in fact has until COVID stopped him coming for all the books he's written since. It's been wonderful. And this is, I believe the ninth, isn't it Tom? Yes, it is. And lots of exciting stuff. I have a surprise guest to add to this, a surprise guest who absolutely loved this book. Wait, you could, I'm just gonna trade seats with you for a minute because then you can talk better. There you are, so have a seat. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, surprise guest. How are you doing? <laughs> I just read, I just read The, um, the Left-Handed God. I, oh my God, it's, it's the best Jane Whitefield yet. Mm. It is so good. I so thoroughly enjoyed it. That stuff. Is it okay if I say Appalachian Trail? I'm not spoiling, right? No, no, you're not at okay, all. Okay, good. Yeah. Because it is that is just so well written and so true. It's just every word of it. I was mesmerized, and enthralled even. God, it was so good. And you ended it on the most perfect note. And I won't spoil that at all. But <laughs> I just, I can't tell you. I think this is the best one. I think of all the nine of the Jane Whitefields, honestly, I think you saved the best for last. Well, Yay, well, you! God, I enjoyed it. He says it's not the last. It's not the last? Really? I it's not. I don't, no, I, I think that, I, you know, I did paint myself into a corner, but you I am planning to paint my way out. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, that's Tom Perry. Of You know, I mean, yes, of course you are. <laughs> but, oh, God, it was, oh, this was a good one. This was just one of the best. Anyway, thank you for that. Well, what a great commercial. Thank you. <laughs> you can quote me, dude. <laughs> Actually, Tom, Dana did give me a quote, which I put into our publicity for the book. So thank you, Dana. Dana's going off and have actual dinner while you and I are talking with them. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, Dana Stabenow, who that was, um, is a very critical reader. She's tough. Um, so when she really likes the book, um, it's well worth listening to her. Um, because she's she doesn't give authors a pass easily at all. But she's been a, um, a friend of Tom's. In fact, Tom and I were both um, honored at the um, voucher con that Dana hosted in Alaska all those years ago. Was yes. it 2011? Uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure. I was thinking it was, it was 27, but I don't know. Maybe it's 20, 2011. But I'm was... not entirely sure either, but I remember what a good time that Tom and I and Diana Gabaldon, who is another, um, there we all were up in Anchorage, Alaska. And, you know, it was it's wonderful. Great. Yep. It was. So Jane, Jane, um, why don't you give us, for people who don't know about Jane, because you haven't written Jane sequentially because you get interested in other stories and other characters and other books that Jane has not had an uninterrupted career. Um, and, and I'll pause just briefly and say that Tom's book, The Old Man, which I thought was wonderful as a standalone. In theory, the movie is actually happening. So we will come back to that. But anyway, Jane, how long ago was it, Tom, when you wrote the first Jane Whitefield? I think it was, uh, I think I actually wrote it in 1991, but it was, it was published, I believe in 1992, The uh, Vanishing Act. Oh, I got to actually, I got a, a, a weird little um, uh, sort of helper for the, for the, the pub publication of that it was Parade Magazine, which, you know, is in a whole lot of newspapers every uh, Sunday. Um, had a little article uh, this week on the 14th, Sunday the 14th, in which they were doing the 101 uh, best mystery books ever. And they, weirdly enough, included Vanishing Act. It was so nice. It was such a, it was such a nice feeling that, that they included that in the list. So that, that's, uh, I'm counting on 
millions of buyers suddenly. <laughs> I love it. You mean in 1992, my God, we're coming up on year 30 together then. About that, yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, okay. Um, so we're still standing, both of us. So that's really good news. But you did, if I remember right, that was a, a very interesting um, start because you had signed a five book contract with your <laughs> publisher. Well, after, five after, Jane yeah. Whitefields and people publishers don't normally do contracts like that it's really unusual that okay. you know somebody would commit to five five books in a series so I thought that was a real testament to the power of your um, design it was uh it was kind and of course you know what what happened was that I had always said I would never do uh, anything but standalones because you know I wanted to rise to high art but uh, as soon as I got a good offer, I immediately started writing a series. <laughs> you caved. <laughs> immediately, instantly. I like to think that I sold out without negotiation, but, uh, you know, my agent at the time did some good negotiating, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a pleasure actually to do that. But I, when, by the time I was done with it, I wanted to write more standalones because I kept thinking of ideas I wanted to pursue and, and uh, you know, I couldn't do it until I was really done with that, uh, those five books. But then uh, later on, I decided I, I missed Jane so much, I wanted to write about her again after that was over. So uh, I've been doing it ever since, every little while when I have something I feel as though is, it's, uh, I don't know, worth my time and the reader's time. <laughs> you, know, you really sort of have to wait until it's there's a reason to write a, a a uh, sequel yeah well your last book was in fact a um, another book about the butcher's boy it and was it Tom's was the first novel the butcher's boy was a sensation it won the edgar award it you know was a it was a huge success and um and eddie's boy is the was the one that he wrote last year um and it was interesting to go back and see him because Coincidentally, hadn't it been something like 30 years or, I mean, what was the time lapse between The Butcher's Boy and Eddie's Boy? Well, uh, let's see, The Butcher's Boy was published in 82 and I wrote it in 1980. So, you know, the publication date, you know, was ultimately 1982. So next year, I guess it'll be the 40th <laughs> anniversary of, of The Butcher's Boy. And, but I mean, I was thinking in Eddie's time, how many years have elapsed between The Butcher's Boy and Eddie's Boy? Oh, the, let's see, the, the first one was Butcher's Boy. The second one was uh, 10 years after that. And then 20 years passed. And I wrote the third one, The Informant. And then the fourth one is, uh, oh, I guess nine years, something like that. Eight or nine years since the last one. But, right. I'm not asking my question right. How many years in Eddie's life have elapsed between in, the Butcher's oh Boy God. and Eddie's well, Eddie, Boy? <laughs> I, I'm not sure what what date I gave Eddie a uh, chance to uh, to die. Actually, I had him die two two different ways in the series. <laughs> Only two people noticed it or wrote back about it. You know, and said, "Hey, why did you change that?" You know, so. Uh, I won't say what, no, it was because I, I realized that I couldn't let him, Eddie, die without the butcher's boy doing more about it than he did in the first book. So I elaborated a little bit more, so. Well, you did, and then and then the sun. Um, I mean, one of the great things about fiction is you can suspend real time. Um, and so, you know, the butcher's boy has gotten older, but not necessarily that older. Jane, despite the, you know, 30 year time span here, Jane's not significantly older than she was when we first met her, right? Well, she's, um, she, during the first bunch of books, she was aging a year each time. And I would, you know, the next year she would remember what had happened in the previous one, which was a year ago. So she knew a little bit more each time and aged a little bit. But at a certain point, um, she was aging too fast for me. I just, you know, I had to slow it down and lie about the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know that it's lying about it. I think that readers are really happy, Tom, to, you know, suspend disbelief. Um, and, you know, they don't want their characters 
to to grow old and certainly if you have a dog in the series i've had this discussion with a couple of others the dog can't get any older you know because dogs have such a short lifespan so i've had a really great discussion with peter abrahams who races spencer quinn about the fact that his his people age but the dog the dog seems to be immortal and and there we are. But you know, you talk yeah. about the fact that Jane um, is relatively recently married to her physician husband in this book. Yeah, well, he's, uh, <laughs> let's see, I, I think they've probably been married something like eight years or something like that. But I, she, she's, um, she's very happily married to him. But, uh, you know, they do have a couple of issues. And, uh, have always had them. That is that, you know, you're this nice, respectable physician was very surprised when he learned what Jane actually was doing during the time when he, when since they had graduated from college together. And, uh, you know, so, well, everything that she does is illegal. Everything she does is dangerous. And it's getting more and more difficult to get away with as she gets older and, and technology improves. And, uh, so does sort of national security. So um, <laughs> Jane has to get a little sharper as she goes along. So, well, I would say that facial recognition technology is a real challenge for you writing writing these series. Um, you know, in in geo tracking. You know, I mean, by now we've all learned that if you're going to be up to something bad, or if you're trying to hide or escape, you don't want to take your phone with you. You want to, you know, get a burner phone or something because it's too easy to track you. So yeah. one of the great things about reading crime fiction is that even if you're not technologically competent, you're forced to learn a certain basic amount of technology because the authors had to learn it in order to make the plots work. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's actually an incredible technology when you think about it. I mean, being able to, to actually pick out a phone you know, I'm, I'm sort of addicted to true crime things that I, I see on television. And I was watching an episode of Body Cam. Do you know what Body Cam is? No, I know. It's a series in which what they show you is the body cameras that cops wear as they go out and do things, you know, do arrest people and so on. And uh, in the midst of that, w one of the cops in one of the, one of the episodes uh, realizes that a, a killer is on the loose and has a he has a guess as to where this person is going to be, and so really in real time practically, he's able to have the phone traced because he knows that it's the phone that the person had taken the phone from the woman who was killed. So, so this guy wow. obviously got it with him, and it, you know it was it was incredibly fast. I never had any idea that it was that quick. You know that you could actually do it in, in that kind of speed. So, well, you know, I don't know. That... Speaking, trying to... <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, you'd have to be in law enforcement to command that kind of um, that kind of speed. I mean, if you read British crime, you know, what you or watch it, because um, there's a ton of long form television. You know produced in Britain and other countries, you realize that CCTV is your, you know, is your problem as a crime writer because they have, I mean, in every British police show that I watch, the first thing the police do is call for the, you know, the camera footage. Because as far as I can tell, there might be like eight feet of England that is not under some sort of camera coverage, but that's not true in the United States, is it? No, no, but it's, it's you know, we're getting more and more of it because people have some private, uh, security systems with cameras. So it's it's uh, relatively easy for the police to go around and ask, you know, did you hit, was your camera working that night or whatever? And, and uh, eventually they often get some civilian footage that serves the same purpose. But I, you know, on the British thing, I'm, I'm, I've always, uh, you know, thought, gee, that's really shutting down a lot of possibilities. Um, if not for writing, at least for my uh, plan to uh, retire and become a criminal at the, in England. But um, you know, I was I was happy to to learn that that crime statistics have not gone down at all since CCTV came in. It, it makes no statistical difference, whatever. I don't know why, but it it's, uh, doesn't seem to be a, a 
effective in crime fighting. So. That's fascinating. I, you know, I just assumed that in fact it was. So wow. did I. So did I. I would, you know, sitting there thinking, "Gee, you know, that's a miraculous, but a little bit creepy uh, development." But it isn't as creepy as I thought, you know. <laughs> So for those of you who um, have formed a, an attachment to Tom and his writing um, and from the standalones and so forth and don't know Jane, we should really go back to basic Jane, Tom, and tell us, you know, how did you conceive this character and um, what is it, what, what, what's her mission? Well, Jane is a person who was born in western New York near the Niagara River, and she is... Um, half Seneca Indian. And um, really, she is, is extremely sort of traditional and yet an extremely modern woman. She went to Cornell University, uh, where she ran track and studied very hard and met a lot of people that she has run in, into since. Uh, and then went back to the small town, imaginary town called Daganawida, uh, which is half, roughly halfway between Niagara Falls and, and Buffalo on the Niagara River, and uh, has a, a relationship still with, with people who are on the Seneca Res Reservation, which is called the Tanawanda Reservation, which is along Tanawanda Creek, uh, maybe 25, 30 miles east of of uh, Buffalo, and uh, she's a traditionalist, as somebody you know said about her in one of the earlier books. Um, she's as conservative as your uh, great grandma, but you know she lives in the world that we live in today. In other words, what Jane does that I like a lot is that she is um, she sees the landscape of Western New York uh, in all of its different states. In other words, she looks at uh, Route 5 going across the, the uh, state of New York um, from essentially the Memorial Auditorium in, at the, in Buffalo, <laughs> right almost at the river, uh, all the way across the state. And, and it's, it follows the exact path of, of uh, the Waaguaneu, which was the, um, um, I don't know, sort of the Seneca Trail that went across to the, the next group, which was, you know, the Cayugas and then to the uh, Onondagas and then to the Oneidas and then to the Mohawks. And so it went all the way across the state. And that was the way they communicated with each other, or one of the ways that they did. You know, they also... Uh, went back and forth by water. But she looks at that, she sees a modern road, but she also knows what it was, what it is, that things happened there. She knows what things happened there. At the same time, she also knows what, what myth says happened in these different places. So that like, if you go to Niagara Falls, uh, you see Niagara Falls and you see the city of Niagara Falls, but uh, a Seneca would know that uh, right behind the falls is where a minor deity named Hino the Thunderer lives. You know, that's why it's so loud, because he lives, he lives behind that curtain of water. Um, you know, so she's, she's really a lot of fun. I mean, she has, the furniture of her mind is different from uh, the things that we grew up with. And so um, she's a, a fun character to, to deal with in that sense. But what she does is that at a certain point in her life in college, she realized uh, that because she had worked a summer job as a skip tracer <laughs> to you know, trace down debts, she knew essentially how to hide from people who are looking for anyone. And at a certain point, one of the friends of hers in college uh, is accused of something and is about to be convicted and she realizes, okay, I know how to do this. I know how to get him out. And so she does. But a number of other friends were aware of the fact that she had done it. And so later on in life at various points, each of them 
remembers that Jane knows how to do that. And so uh, <laughs> a couple of them are lawyers and a couple of them are people who, uh, you know, at some point or other meet somebody who are, who is in desperate trouble. And so that they show up at Jane's door and, uh, you know, she's takes people away from a place where they believe they're going to be murdered and, uh, takes them to other parts of the country where uh, nobody knows them. And she teaches them how to, to live as new people, which um, is kind of based really on, uh, in, in my mind, that is the way I thought of it, was that that was very much like what happened when uh, any of the Iroquois nations adopted people. Um, they were at, at war constantly. And so they were constantly trying to replenish their population or trying, not necessarily trying to, but let's say they were willing to increase the population so that there were all sorts of people who had been in different walks of life or had been, uh, I don't know, they're running away from wars or they were captured by someone or other. And occasionally this, the Senecas would um, allow one of them to become a Seneca. And what they did was they changed your name to be the name of somebody who had been lost. That is, you would, you would not only get the person's name, but the, the person's entire identity. And um, you would also assume his relatives and his responsibilities. So that essentially, in a way, you would become a replacement for this person who had been lost. And uh, what Jane does is, is essentially that. She gives a person an entire life. She has ways of, of uh, getting false identification. Um, she has ways of sort of building identities over periods of years so that they'll stand up when anybody uh, investigates. Say, so who is this person? Well, this person has you know, had a credit card for 15 years with this company and we know who he is and etc. <laughs> yeah, it's really basically her own version of witness protection. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a private, not government operation for witness protection. And what I've always loved is that you know you invert the sort of you know Indian tracker idea we have, you know, about how great their observational and cultural skills, you know, had prepared them to track people, and you reverse it and make Jane disappear people rather than track them down. Um, and to do that over the course of the books, there have been some pretty wide ranging landscapes that, you know, some of your books have covered a large geographical era area as Jane has done it. But it seems to me, to, I'm trying to remember which book it was. Was it two or three books ago? You and I had a, a wonderful discussion because somebody, you, you'd kind of done what you knew about the Senecas, but a real Seneca came along and wow. offered to um, consult with you so right. that you would get all the, the Seneca Indian stuff right. Um, and so Jane's been closer to home since then, hasn't she? Well, um, the, the person that you're talking about is, is a, a Seneca um, attorney named right. Paul Williams, who um, that's you know his English name, but he has another name. Um, but uh, he is a person who has spent an entire career looking out after um, essentially Native American rights. And he's, a, he's Canadian and he uh, lives on the uh, um, Bransford, I guess they, they call it a reserve <laughs> That's, um, in Canada. And um, as far as I know, he's still still working, even though he's he's done quite a few things over the years. He was one of the people who uh, essentially negotiated for the um, Mohawks in the uh, uh, the Oka um, crisis uh, many years ago, it was about twenty years ago or so, in which uh, what had happened was that there was a whole bunch of land that had been placed in trust for the uh, for the Mohawks um, with the Catholic Church. 
um, you know, with the missionaries, et cetera, in, in those days, you know, it was in the, the early 1700s. Um, and they remained uh, essentially in trust, those, those lands, until at a certain point, the church just decided to sell it, to sell them as though it were something that they owned. And the Mohawks were extremely angry. Uh, you know, at a certain point, there was, uh, it got so bad that there were uh, sort of police on the outside of the, the uh, reservation and a whole bunch of uh, Mohawks who were equally well armed um, on the inside of the reservation. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a kind of a tense time, but he was one of the people who defused that and he, who, or let's say, worked to defuse it. You know, when, whenever anything um, bad is about to happen, everybody has to be willing to compromise and, and get along. But let's say he was one of the leading people to do that. So he's, he's a wonderful person. And he's, he wrote to me one time, um, just before that book, that was a uh, poison flower. Right. And uh, he said, you know, I've been reading these Jane Whitefield books for about 20 years, and I like them. But, you know, I've been meaning to write to you sometime and just let you know, there's a couple of things I don't think you understand. And he proceeded to, you know, uh, in a, a, I guess it was about a three page single space letter, just tell me what those things were. And I thought, oh my God, what a, what a wonderful thing, what a gift that somebody would give you that, uh, that information. Um, it was just things about modern life and, you know, among the Senecas, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it was really helpful. And, um, so it actually inspired me to write that book. I was working on something else and I put it, set it aside and I don't know if I ever picked it up again. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote Poison Flower, you know, based on a lot of that information. And then, um, you know, when I thanked him for it, he sent me, I think a six page letter, single spaced, typed <laughs> with even more information. And it was all wonderful stuff. And, and it was things that, uh, you know, I had either misinterpreted or needed to think about more and so on and he even had um, things that were good to read that were you know that I uh, it would be very useful for me to to look at and I did so it was it was just great I didn't send him this book but I um, you know because I had what the idea I had really had more to do with with uh, I don't know let's say things that um, were closer to my life than to his at the at that time, and I. But I always use in some of that information, little bits of the information that he gave me years ago. So, <laughs> it's well, I'm, I'm sure that it, it, it enriched the series, and you know we have this whole cultural appropriation thing going on. So you know I think it's great that that he's lent his own authenticity, so to speak, to you know to what you're to what you're writing. Um, so in order to make these books work, there has to be a person in peril, right. um, you know, and so you have to create that character, but you also have to create their whole backstory and why it is that they, that they are referred because it works that way to, it's not like Jane advertises or anything that they are referred to Jane. So what is that the scenario in uh, the left-handed twin, what is it that you know? Who is the person that Jane is going to have to focus on? Uh, her name is is Sarah Doughton, and she is uh, a young girl who has come to Los Angeles and uh, is working in basically a Starbucks. Um, that isn't. I don't think I call it a Starbucks, but she's <laughs> working as a barista in and. Uh, selling coffee and this sort of intriguing young man keeps coming in day after day. And uh, eventually, and he, he, she can tell that he's maneuvering to be sure that she's the one that he talks to and, and who waits on him and, and uh, at the counter. And, but he always seems to come in at about 11 o'clock in the morning and he appears a little bit disheveled. That is as though he's been awake very late and that he has this really interesting life going on. 
and eventually they go out and uh, he takes her to a party. And there were during the actually these these parties are, are something that uh, have been kind of an annoyance <laughs> in Los Angeles, at least in this part of Los Angeles, because in particular large hillside homes, um, people will will essentially rent out these these uh, sort of palatial houses for you know for a party that people will will hold a party uh there and it gets very noisy and goes very late and there's a lot of traffic and a lot of uh, headaches for people and they became sort of passe during the um during the during the covid epidemic because they kept having those and you know suddenly that was an issue you know that really you can't you couldn't at that time anyway have you know 300 people at a house having a party, a loud party with no masks and no distancing and no anything during that period. So the police began to kind of crack down on it and it hasn't really come back to the extent that it, that I was afraid it would, I, you know, but uh, it was going on for a long time. But he takes her to a party and it's one of those. It's a big party with people who have some, let's say, hope of or pretense to celebrity and uh they make a lot of noise and have a lot of fun and um she realizes that this man whose name is albert uh what he does for a living is essentially um take advantage of this this party life that is that he will try to um obtain things that are useful for, for the party, either drugs or, you know, some sort of supply like uh, high-end champagne or, or something. And what happens is that he talks somebody into providing these things as a gift so that uh, they will be welcome in this exclusive party. But what he's doing really is essentially getting these people to pay his way you know, <laughs> and right. to make him welcome and so on and you know he becomes more and more uh sort of predatory in trying to uh, take advantage of these parties and she stays that is she realizes that even after one of these parties it's a lot more fun than uh working and standing on your feet pouring coffee for people and so she essentially falls in love with him over a period of of, uh, of time, but she's his companion and sort of a, um, partner almost. She becomes more and more part of the the scam, and eventually she becomes a little bit more popular among all, all the people that that uh, run these parties because she's a this beautiful girl, uh, and. She begins to do a little bit of modeling on a kind of informal basis and so on. And eventually she ends up, um, let's say being a bit overconfident and ends up cheating on Albert. And Albert's reaction is to uh, pick her up for theoretically to go to a party. But what he does is takes her to the place, to the place where the man lives that she cheated with and kills him in front of her and uh sarah testifies against him but his lawyer is good enough to get her her uh testimony kind of discounted and he he ends up being um, acquitted and once he's acquitted the next person he's going to want to kill is her because she betrayed him in essentially two ways. Um, so this is the reason why she comes to Jane. And uh, I don't know, Jane provides her with uh, her usual services. And, uh, and the book is off. <laughs> and the book begins. Yes, things get going. <laughs> The whole thing in Los Angeles was really fascinating. I'm, I'm astonished by people who are making their careers as quote influencers or, you know, <laughs> people who are um, 
if, if you want to have a, a successful party, you need to have some kind of celebrity or, you know, a draw, so mm -hmm. to speak. But, you know, I'm amazed at the, at the income that all these intangibles can seem to create for people. I was reading about, I mean, I didn't even know you could do this, professional gamers and how hazardous this is for their health. Because if they get up for a bathroom break or if they, you know, get up to go and eat or something like that, instead of sitting for hours at their gaming council, then they may lose some of their audience and therefore some of their income. And of course, my question is, who in the world has time to sit there for five or six hours and watch somebody playing a game? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more puzzled about the audience than I am about the person who's making a living doing this. And the, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have been exploring um, the, the COVID situation for people who quit their jobs or who never got a real job, but it, well, you know, what I think of as a real job, um, and looking into how people have generated income. And I'm just completely fascinated by it. So when I read your book, and I think this guy has worked out, you know, um, I, I mean, it's, it's a scam. And it, it gets him into parties, but he also is able to make money off it, right? I mean, actual money off it and develop quite a good income. And she became a real asset to that. Right. So that's one reason he's so pissed off at her, um, is that she's not only being unfaithful to him in a, in a sexual sense, but she's jeopardizing their income stream. Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, not only not necessarily the present income stream, but also uh, the fact that as she gets more popular, that she can become sort of his in to the to better and better parties or right. more and more exclusive parties. And, and of course, getting somebody to do a favor or pay him something or whatever in order to get in becomes, you know, you can raise the price. You can raise the price because these are people that you've actually heard of. They're not sort of the faces of tomorrow. You can you know, <laughs> do that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was really blown away by that. And I was wondering, you know, minor celebrities might rent themselves out, so to speak, for parties, but I'm wondering how far up the line you go. You know, I mean, can you actually get Meryl Streep to show up, you know, for um, <laughs> it's something like that? I mean, I, it, Hollywood, it, I mean, I'm not sure that that's a national phenomenon. Do you think that that's really local to Hollywood, which is a celebrity obsessed culture to begin with? Well, it's... Uh, a combination of things. One is that, you know, there are these big houses up in the hills where, you know, people have really probably always had kind of giant parties and things going on. But, um, you know, during the last few years, it really did in, increase. I mean, there were these, these houses that were built where, you know, the person who had them built or owns them or whatever, it virtually never lived in them. They're just, you know, they just rent them out for parties. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's an odd way of life. And, and there have always been people, a lot of people um, surrounding the rich, you know, anybody yeah. who's, who's, uh, you know, rich and wants to show off and have a great party or whatever has to, um, <laughs> pay a lot of money to a lot of people for their services, you know, for, um, uh, I don't know, liquor, um, bartending, um, security, uh, right. flowers, whatever, you know, things, any, anytime you do a huge party. And of course, you know, and music, um, that all becomes, and there are reasons for each of these people to want to be involved that are not immediate payment a lot of times uh you know there are musicians who probably charge less than they they could just to be heard by the right people you know or at least to believe that they're being heard by the right people and stuff it's just you know it's an interesting interesting life uh well it is you know i've been fascinated the whole airbnb phenomenon that's really you know i i when did a house become a an income asset? I mean, I always think of a house as a place where people live, but you know what they've actually become thanks to Airbnb and then this party rental thing that you're talking about 
is um, is is just a money making machine where you can acquire it and then you generate income from it. Um, and you know, I find that a whole a weird mindset. I am really grateful that we live in a community that does not allow short term rentals because uh -huh. you know there there have been some horrendous problems for the neighbors of houses that become either Airbnb rentals. And, and they're not supervised, so they end up being kind of party houses or actual party houses. Um, and I wonder if that's actually, Tom, kind of nudge more people to have HOAs or, you know, to live in communities where there's some regulation. I don't know. It's it's hard to hard to know because um, LA is, is there is no place like LA. LA is just what you know. It's the only one, and it's. Um, if you want to be involved in any of the industries that are centered here, you know, uh, uh, you sort of have to be nearby and you have to keep showing up to things or people will think you're dead. And if you, if you don't uh, show up for <laughs> every once in a while, you are dead. <laughs> so you, uh, you know, you do, I think, have to keep, keep some sort of uh, presence. And it doesn't have to be necessarily a social presence, but there are, you know, certain age groups and certain kinds of people are interested in this. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Meryl Streep is, it would be the opposite of that kind of person, I would say, you know, not only is there no place for her to go up, but, you know, she doesn't even live here. <laughs> so, well, no, I picked her as a totally unlikely candidate. Yeah. You know, what a cool it would be to actually get her. Well, back to Jane. So anyway, this young woman comes to Jane and she's in fear of her life that, that the boyfriend who's been acquitted um, for murdering um, the man that, that this young woman got involved in unwisely as it all turned out. But, you know, maybe she was really looking for an exit from this party life in this guy anyway. It's hard to tell. Um, the stakes go up because the guy, um, the boyfriend, turns out to be able to bring in some bigger guns. We oh, don't need to go further than that. But the threat escalates dramatically. And Jane's past is the real reason for that, because the, the threat, the new threat, the Russians, um, figure that if they could just manage to catch Jane, they could extort the location of various people she's helped. And, you know, um, it's like, it's basically breaking into witness protection, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and securing yeah. the identity of somebody who's got a whole new life. And then presumably, I assume you don't want to kill an asset like that because it's a financial asset. Presumably the idea would be to blackmail them, assuming that they have been successful in whatever their new life is. Well, or turn them over to the people that have been looking for them all this time. Well, that too, for money. Yeah, because it could be like a bounty hunter, right? right? Or somebody who just hates them, you know, and wants, yeah. wants them dead. But it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Jane really obviously has a reason to to uh, suspect that something, something more is going on than, than looking for this young woman from, you know, Los Angeles. They're, they're looking for somebody something bigger and, and uh, more profitable. And it's her, unfortunately. Well, but, yeah, you've really put Jane at risk now. I mean, you know, she was always she was always at risk as she was discovered in the process of disappearing somebody. Right. But, you know, she's felt fairly secure all this time that, you know, she is not, not going to be exposed. And so here she is all of a sudden at personal risk herself. Now, how does this impact her relationship with her husband? Problems, problems. But uh, Carrie has at times been, let's say, more adamant about you know how she should, you know, get out of that activity than he is now. Because in uh, I forget it was I don't know book five or so, uh, he had to ask her to to save somebody that he knew. His old mentor, this, this doctor that had taught him after uh, you know when he was a, a resident, and um, so he's been a little bit more uh, 
tolerant of what she's done or what the reasons are, why it would be necessary for anybody to do that, because he's he's seen it once, seen it, you know, close up. Um, but also, uh, when you realize that certain things have changed in the relationship, um, in the first place, he trusts her more, you know, and, this, and the second place, um, he realizes how good she is at it. And at the same time, um, as I said, he's benefited from it. So, uh, and she's, she does it less often now. That is when Sarah shows up, she's not expecting anybody to show up and, and hasn't had anybody for a couple of years come uh, get in touch with her and, and need to be saved. So I think he's taken a little bit uh, by surprise this time because he thought it was over. But the only person who can say it's over is Jane. Yeah. Well, he'd be really hypocritical if having used her services himself, you know, he, he then asked her not to do that. So, you know, you did a, a good thing, I think, by, you know, giving him a stake in the whole thing. And, you know, now there he is, but he certainly doesn't like it. Um, he worries about her. Um, yes. And of course, because she's actually personally so much more at risk in this book, you know, the stakes are a lot higher for everybody. Yeah. But, um, so the landscape of this book is what? Nina touched on it when she popped in for a minute. So instead of being in Los Angeles, whenever you actually end up going northeast right well what she ends up doing is uh kind of moving sarah from place to place because there seems to be this extremely you know, efficient group of people who uh keep turning up or somebody that she suspects uh is involved with them keeps turning up and she it doesn't know yet whether it's something that she doesn't know about Sarah or whether it's actually her because she she does you know sort of realize that at some point somebody's going to come after her again um so she keeps moving from one place in the northeast to another and each time it, it becomes unsafe after a while then she realizes that she's got to move her again and moves on until finally she uh, finds a place that she feels fairly safe in, in leaving her. But then uh, when Jane takes off to theoretically go home, she realizes that uh, she can't go home because she's leading these people toward Carrie. Oh. And uh, so Jane does something that's kind of extreme, which is a, a, a turn that I, I really like in this book. I feel good about it is when, you know, you're in cities and there's an organized crime group after you. And you're, you're the one who's always uh, in danger and always the underdog and always running. Once you get in and follow Jane into uh, the wilderness, um, the odds are very different. You, you know, they don't know who they're following, who it is that they're actually following into the, into the woods and that she will be the one who's uh, got the advantage in a way. Well, uh, yeah, no, I think it's, it's a wonderful twist and, you know, it's fun to, I've, I've been, I mean, Maine's a huge state. We always forget that Maine's a border state. That's one of the things that comes up, you know, through Minnesota and Montana and other places too, but Maine is um, a gateway to Canada. I've actually been on a trip in Canada where we were allowed to go down to Maine to visit a candy factory right up where Canada and Maine, you know, come together. So right. it was an interesting, it was interesting, you know, to enter Maine as a foreign country, so to speak. Uh, that perspective of it was, was different, right. um, but it has a lot of rugged landscape. Um, very yeah. rugged landscape and so it's a wonderful place you know for this kind of action to occur and you know I, I love reading about different landscape one of the reasons I really like crime fiction is all the places that it takes me you know that I might not necessarily go so have you personally spent time in Maine I mean Tom you're from back 
in the Buffalo area, aren't you? Originally, yeah, I mean, you've been I'm, in Los Angeles all the time I've known you, but didn't you grow up back in that area? Yeah, I did. I grew up in a city which is right on the the landscape where Jane is lives. In fact, she lives uh, pretty much at the end of my parents' street. <laughs> right and to the right a little bit and that was uh there's a, a house that you know could have been Jane's actually there are four of them in a row but um <laughs> but yeah I've been in Maine but um I didn't do what she does which is she, she ends up in the uh on the Appalachian Trail um there's right. a, which has this terminus in Maine doesn't it go all the way up yeah. to that I'm trying to remember the name of the mountain mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Katahdin. It's yeah, Katahdin. So doesn't yeah. the Appalachian Trail, actually, that's either the terminus or the start, depending on which direction you're going to go, of the yeah. Appalachian Trail? Yes, it is. It's one end of it and uh, the northern end, of course. And um, right below that is begins this place that they call the 100 Mile Wilderness, which is a, it's literally 100 miles of uh, trail that where there are no services, no towns, no uh, anything, no, you can't get cell coverage, you can't, as far as I know, um, you can't do a lot of things that, uh, you know, if, if you get hurt, you're in deep, deep trouble, you know, because there isn't any, anybody there to help you necessarily, except other, can't, other hikers. So, you know, it, it is literally what it's, what it's called. That is, it's 100 miles of wilderness as though there were, there were no world outside. So she's, you know, <laughs> that's where Jane tries to lose these people. Well, I can tell you because I lived um, for part of my life um, in eastern Tennessee and southwest Virginia. Anyway, the Appalachian Trail was well, not too far away. Yeah. And there were many tragedies um, of for families who took children and so forth, or even actual just hikers. Um, the rhododendron hills, as they are called, were so incredibly dense that went along the trail in that, in that part of the trail yeah. that a person could step off the trail into one of those rhododendron hills and become disoriented and lost and completely invisible and not found. Um, yeah. You know, just, um, just you wouldn't think that... <clears throat> excuse me, that you could disappear off um, so completely thoroughly off a fairly well-traveled stretch. But in fact, you could. And there are several children in the time I lived there that, you know, their parents were camping or something and they would go off on their own and were never, never seen again. Um, or they were found eventually trapped in one of these hells. So, you know, it is possible that even if you have a trail that a lot of people are moving on, that you can disappear right off the edges of it. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> it's not hard to disappear in the forest, and of course, um, you know, a lot of it is is uh, sort of different from that. You know, and there's you go all the way; it goes all the way down to Georgia. So you have, mm -hmm. you know, you have a huge variety of, of uh, different kinds of terrain and, and uh, sure. vegetation and so on. But, um, you know, it's an interesting thing that uh, how, how the trail kind of, uh, I don't know, skirts civilization. Like there's a uh, one part of it, one of the entrances to the Appalachian Trail is, at, is maybe uh, 300 yards uh, away from, um, the Dartmouth College campus that you you just walk between two buildings <laughs> on, on Main Street and here you are you know you just you just sort of take a right turn and you know you meet the trail and go wherever you're it's going. interesting that you know people have a history of wanting to make and maybe it's a definition or something definitional thing of wanting to um, make journeys along you know, certain pathways now you can think about you know the um the trail in spain you know the mm -hmm. santiago or you can think about el camino real and and whatever but you know it's it, i've often thought that it was sort of a 
you know, a way to measure things. You know, you can set yourself a challenge. You know, I'm going to walk the Appalachian Trail, or I'm going to walk this part of it, or I'm going to walk, you know, the, um, you know, the Camino in Spain and so forth. And uh, pilgrims routes, um, you know, have been established over over millennia. So, you know, I, I really like the way you you took the trail and then used it in this particular way in the book. Um, it works really well. So we can't talk about the great ending and we can't talk about what might be happening to Jane and all that other good stuff. So we probably ought to call Patrick up and see if he has any questions or comments that he might like to make. Oh, I sure. love Tom because he once said to me that he starts all his book tours with me because until I tell him what his book is about, what to say, he doesn't want to go on tour. <laughs> so I hope that we've provided you with some material here. Yes, you yeah, have. That's, that's good. <laughs> well, you not only uh, gave me your thoughts, but you also made me th think by asking me those questions. And so, you know, I, uh, it's been fun. We've been doing this together for a really long time. Yes. Well, so, Patrick, anything yeah. to contribute? Well, I wanted to ask uh, Tom, did, did you happen to see um, Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad, those two shows? Um, <laughs> there's a reason yeah well i i watched um breaking bad for a while and and stopped i haven't watched better call Saul. well there's a character that was played by the the late great uh robert forster who has a role very similar to jane's and he helps uh one of the key characters in the book disappear and oh. when i when i saw the character um and it, it starts with a telephone call. And basically, once you make the call and agree to meet on a certain corner, there's no going back, you know, uh, and and he plucks you out of your life. And, and it, it was just, uh, I couldn't help but think of Jane. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I uh, I didn't see that character. I, um, I always... Uh... <laughs> if I can think of... Um, or if I can find, there's probably a very specific, he, he was really featured in a couple of key episodes. And if I can find a, like a YouTube or something, I'll send it to you, Tom. I think you'd really like it. Well, you know, thank you. I, I uh, actually, I may, I have another source that I, that I may be able to find that from because my daughter got married last Saturday. And the guy that she married, his father is a, uh, is was the line producer on that show so oh. you know he was the guy that made things ha actually happen and stuff so uh you know I'll, i can probably ask him what <laughs> what that was or you know right 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 and also you know speaking of television i mean now that tv is finally caught up you know and they're making really interesting programs you know i mean this is the the renaissance of tv Jane would be so perfect if it was done well. Oh, wow. What's going on there? Um, it's optioned. You know, it's been optioned pretty much continuously since 1992. And as each book gets, you know, added, it's, there's, there's more, I guess, to option. But they, it, it was re-optioned about, I don't know, a year ago or so. So it's um, still tied up. Um, but I, I always have some hope that somebody will come up with a, a an easy, good way to portray Jane. Um, I it I get nervous about it in a way because I I don't want to see it done badly. I hope um, you know when you're when you're talking about somebody else's ethnicity and the the history of of their family, basically, you know what you're doing is you're writing about their grandmother. No. And, and it, there's a there's a huge responsibility to try to be accurate and try to be respectful and and uh, things like that and um, <laughs> you don't know whether other people are going to feel that way and and once you uh, sign over your your product, what you know, your, your what you're writing, your your character, and so on. Um, you have no control anymore. You know, nobody nobody holds a gun to your head and says, "Sign this contract and take our money." <laughs> but 
once you've done it, you really, you know, can't control anything. So, uh, Jane, you know, you've got multiple books about Jane, so long form television would work for her, but you've written a number of standalones and uh -huh. the old man, that standalone is actually, it's being made into a movie, not long form television. So what's yeah. happening there? It's television. It's, it's, oh, uh, it is television? Yeah. Right. It's FX Hulu. And it, there are 10 episodes. It's, you know, oh. And it uh, essentially, you know, they're filming the last three now. Uh, they were originally set to uh, <clears throat> to do those earlier, but then COVID got in the way. And then the star, Jeff Bridges, uh, was ill during the last year or so. Um, and he is uh, is well now, and they're they're actually filming. So, uh, oh, that's exciting! I don't know why I thought it was a movie rather than um, episodic television. Well, what happens is that you know anything like that that's been around for a while, um, there are numerous ideas that people propose. You know, and that there were times when that you know it was proposed that that would be a, a movie. And other times, you know, when uh, it would be something else. But this particular uh, <laughs> uh, attempt is um, is going very well, and it's it's going to be a TV show. So uh, we'll have to see how that. Uh, but they're right now, you know, in the uh, the sort of upfront things that they do, the, the networks do to to I don't know get their sponsors and and everybody else interested. Uh, they estimated that it would probably air in June. Uh, you know, it'll be available on FX Hulu in June. So we'll see. Well, you you know, you come from um, a long career writing in Hollywood. So how interesting for you that now you've got something that's being turned into this. Have you had a previous, I, I can't remember, have you had a previous film treatment or, or TV treatment of any of your books? No, nope. it's uh, it's one of those things where many are, many have been called, but few were chosen. I, uh, I, everything virtually, you know, gets, gets optioned by, you know, somebody or other for some project, but um, they, uh, none of mine have ever, ever made it to the, the point where anybody actually exposed any film until this one. That's so odd because I think particularly some of your standalones have had absolutely made for movie plots. You know, the one the one where the girl, you know, they're running around in Beverly Hills disguised as dog walkers or whatever it is. I can, you know, I'm somewhat hazy there, but I love that book. And, you know, I would have thought that would make an absolutely terrific movie. Well, it's, uh, you know, it was option for movie and, you know, other other things have been too. Sometimes they, you know, what happens is you'll get sort of a wash of attention and maybe enthusiasm and then it just sort of goes away because somebody or other wasn't able to solve it or sell it or get right. the right people interested or something. And uh, then it'll come back. That'll, you know, it'll be a, the next wave will come in. <laughs> And once you get one that's made this successful, it's um, a lot easier. So, you know, I think if, if, if the old man does as one hopes it will do, then there's more likely to be attention to some of your other stories. I was thinking about Ann Cleves. She can't write a book now that is not, you know, made for British television. Yeah. You know, after Vera and Shetland and now, um, now her new book, um, her new series in Devon. But they've all been so successful that probably she can't write anything that won't turn into long form television now. That's right. We should all be so inflicted. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it would be good you to know, have. There's a lot of luck involved. And in, in, unfortunately, a lot of it depends on if, if a personality is attached. Um, I mean, Anne herself will tell you that Brenda Blythem, you know, the Vera woman, is just so amazing that, you know, that it works. So, not everybody's been fortunate in the casting of their of their books. Right, but you know, I, I've been as fortunate as I could possibly be with this. So yeah. we'll see, I mean, it's, uh, you know. And you've lived you know. long enough to see it happen, Tom. We have yep. to think that way at our age, right? That's right, that's right. I may not live through reruns, but I'll see. <laughs> uh, anything else, Patrick? Um, nothing specific. Uh, 
But I wanted to ask you, Tom, I mean, so many of your books deal with, uh, you know, people that have very specialized skill sets, you know, and there's so much craftsmanship and competence, uh, you know, that normal people don't possess. Um, were you, I don't really have a question, but when you were a kid, were you interested in things like, you know, magic and sleight of hand and what yeah. sort of things uh, appealed to you as a kid? Well, I don't know. I think the thing that appealed to me most about, you know, when I was a kid was the, the prospect of not being a kid anymore. <laughs> Growing up and being, you know, one of the people who uh, sort of decided what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. But I, you know, I have always admired people who have some expertise that I don't have, you know, and, and so I often try to find out what that is or how how do you do that? How does that work? What's the, that kind of thing? I mean, uh, I think we should remain curious. And, and I, uh, I hope I'm as curious as I was when I was a kid, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's-, it's Well, for instance, I remember we talked about, I think we talked last time about Joe Gores, you oh, yeah. know, and how he, he had all that knowledge, it's very specific trade yeah. craft knowledge of the burglar's yeah. tools and it was always fun to to listen to him yes it was it was it was a terrific thing it was a privilege to be able to to talk to him about uh you know a number of of uh different areas and i also i also liked the way he did things like um you know when he did uh romany uh families and and all this stuff he would he would try to include a bit of the language, you know, so that, that when they, you know, you don't always get just English, you get, you know, also some sense that, uh, that there's another language behind this and, and things like 32 that. 32 Cadillacs. I'm yeah. telling you, that was a really fabulous book. He was, I, I really miss Joe. He was a wonderful writer, but you know, Tom, you are such a wizard plotter and you are so good at dreaming up, you know, scams and, you know, just amazing stuff. I've always thought that you had a natural bent for, you know, you're a natural criminal, but you're also a really upright moral person. So maybe, maybe you channeled what could have been a great career as a criminal as to being a wonderful writer. I don't know. Maybe I was just too lazy to do any of it. I just <laughs> wrote it down. <laughs> but, well, but you, I, know, you really, you really are a master of intricate plot, plotting. I mean, some of your plots, you know, it has to work like clockwork in order to make it happen. And you've brought in, you know, evil Russians. You've got, you know, you've created some astonishing villains. Well, thank you. I just, you know, I I feel great that that people have have appreciated things that, that you put in you know when you when you do this you're you're sort of um exposing uh yourself to criticism or hatred or anything you know just boredom boredom sheer boredom um and and it feels great when people like it and and well you know oftentimes you you have people patrick's right that you've got a lot of people that have amazing skill sets but you're often good at, at taking, a, you know, a, a sort of ordinary person and thrusting them into um, a situation where, you know, where, I mean, your insurance scam book is still remains one of my all time favorites. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you put people into, into situations and then see how they, how they cope. And some of them are kind of ordinary people that wind up doing criminal things. And some of them are trying not to do criminal things. So I'm always surprised by your books. I mean, every book you write is a surprise. Well, thank you. That's that's really uh, that's a great compliment. It's something that I really I try I try to surprise people. I you know I, I do try to feel as though okay, you may like this, you may not like this, but you haven't read it before. You know, you haven't seen it in a movie, you haven't watched it on television. And that um, that's also how I, I judge other people's books sometimes, you know. Have I, have I, is this just a rehash of something that I read 20 years ago? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, if, uh, if I've avoided that sin, I feel, 
I feel good. And, and well, you should. I mean, you know, you've had a, a marvelous career and you certainly deserve all the accolades and awards and so forth that you won. But I'm really pleased for you, since you live in Hollywood, I'm really pleased for you that you are getting a TV <laughs> adaptation because I, I think it must be hard to live in Los Angeles and not do that. Well, um, I don't know. We worked in it. It was a fun, you know, Joe and I were, were uh, my wife. Uh, not everybody knows who Joe is. Joe is my wife, and we we met working in universities, and uh, got married. And then at a certain point, somebody asked me if I wanted to write television, and um, so I said, you know, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so um, you know, you you sort of called the wrong guy, and uh, this person said, well, you know, I'm I'm. Uh, interested in, in seeing if you can, if you would like to write television, if you don't like it, you know, you can just go back to working in universities where you are, you know. Um, and so I went down the hall to uh, my wife's office and, and asked her what she thought. And she said, Yeah, why don't you do it? Why don't you give it a try? You're bored with what you're doing right now. And if you get, uh, you know, get stuck, I'll, I'll help you. And, you know, that was not an empty offer because, you know, she at least had seen scripts and th things of that sort. She was brought up here and her, her father was a comedy writer. And uh, so that was sort of, we ended up doing that for 11 years. So it was, it was, uh, was fun for us. But when, at the point where we left and stopped doing it, uh, I sort of didn't care whether I ever did it again. You know, it was we had done enough, and it was sort of fun, and we loved the people and and the experience and so on. But uh, I don't know that I would have been happy if I had had a forty year career in that field because you know, as you as you get older, it's not really your your generation that you're trying to speak to anymore. So. Uh, I think you become more and more out of it in a way, you know, so, which is not necessarily true for some reason in writing uh, fiction, I guess because you have more time to figure out what it is and examine, you know, the, the questions that you want to look into and examine the, I don't know, the place where it takes place and so on, but I think uh, you know, I would be a little too slow on the uptake, probably for modern television. We, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote Star Trek: "Live long and prosper." Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to have that, you know, that deal. I've, I've always been a belief. I made lots of mistakes in my life and all, but I, I, you know, I've survived to have a happy ending, and I really think that, you know, a happy ending. I agree with Robert Dugoni in his recent book when he said that, um, you know. Um, having a long life is a privilege. It's not a right, yeah. you know, living long. And um, yeah. and for those of us who are doing that, I think um, that we have to regard it as a privilege. And um, you know, you've, done a, you've done a wonderful job with it. Um, I'm gonna keep trucking for a while longer. We'll see where we are. So <laughs> I think on that note, probably before we get totally maudlin, we should call this off. It's been a wonderful time to talk to you. Uh, Patrick, thanks as always for your tech support. Yep. We do have autographed copies of The Left-Handed Twin in stock at the Poison Pen. And you don't actually have to have read an earlier Jane Whitefield to read this book. It stands completely alone. Make a, I think, a fabulous gift. So if you're thinking about, you know, what to buy people. Great thing about books is they don't spoil. You can, you know, they can, nobody can have too many books because nothing bad happens to them while they're sitting on the shelf except that you wish you were reading one. Anyway, um, Tom, love to Joe. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in March when you and Joe come here for the Brandeis Annual Author Lunch, which will be live again this year. So that's terrific news. Yes. So happy holidays to you. Same and good night, Patrick. We spent most of the day together. So yes, we have. probably like to go home. <laughs> have some other good night, company. Tom. Great to see Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 
100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.